Um, Dale is a friend and acquaintance over a number of years and a remarkable individual. Born in the West Indies, where he completed his medical school training, he went on to become a Rhodes Scholar and obtained a PhD in physiology at Oxford, where he conducted clinical research studies related to insulin resistance and hypertension. He uh, came to the United States after his internship in the West Indies and did his in internal medicine training at Northwestern University and then went on to Harvard, where again, he was a clinical research fellow. Starting in clinical research, he transitioned to a faculty position at Beth Israel, where he began mechanistic um, experimental studies, working to study the role of GLUT4, the insulin-activated glucose transporter, with Barbara Kahn. Um, he continued uh, to do mechanistic studies after going to the University of Utah, where he uh, rose to the rank of professor and focused his research on understanding mechanisms linking diabetes to congestive heart failure and uh, initiating research related to mitochondrial dysfunction uh, in the heart in diabetes. He became the head of uh, a Diabetes Research Center in Iowa and the head of the Department of Medicine before recently moving to UCLA, where he is now the chairman of the Department of Medicine. And I think really, um, you know, is able to perform one of his other great talents, which is that of mentoring and guiding the development and the careers of others. Um, he received the Auerbach Prize from the Endocrine Society and later became president of the Endocrine Society. He's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and is, I think, past president of the Association of Professors of Medicine. And this year has been uh, elected to the National Academy of Science. In addition, as you can see from being a very handsome guy, uh, Dale is gifted with a real generosity of spirit that uh, makes him an important uh, uh, contributor to the world of diabetes. And um, we're delighted, Dale, to have you here today and look forward to your talk. Terry, thank you very much for the, the kind introduction. Let me uh, share my screen. And I hope we get this right. Let's see. Um, what do you see? That's it. Perfect. Excellent. Um, so. It's a real, a, a real privilege for me to be speaking with you this afternoon. And um, I thought I would give you a talk about some of our recent work um, looking at mechanisms linking um, mitochondria with um, cardiometabolic um, disease. Um, and I have no disclosures. So I think as everybody knows, and you know, this is very apropos this being um, the diabetes day at the University of Illinois, that um, you know, diabetes complications really drives the suffering of individuals with diabetes. And um, when I was a medical student in the last century, a lot of the focus was on you know microvascular disease um, leading to retinopathy, um, nephropathy, and neuropathy, um, leading to blindness, renal failure, and 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 pain. Um, however, really, the, the major driver of mortality in diabetes, I think, as we all know, is um, cardiovascular events. Um, specifically um, myocardial infarction and stroke. And um, although that was kind of known for a long time, the, the realization that diabetes was a driver of that is um, somewhat more um, recent. This slide just summarizes a lot of studies, um, some meta-analysis published a decade ago, we're just making the case that, you know, diabetes amplifies cardiovascular risk. So you can see very clearly that um, when you look at various kinds of stroke or ischemic heart disease, it's roughly a twofold increase in, in risk in individuals um, with uh, diabetes. So I put my laser pointer on here. Okay, so um, then, you know, when one tests back and thinks about sort of pathophysiology of, you know, the metabolic syndrome and type two diabetes, clearly there's a, a component of obesity and, uh, and overnutrition. Multiple pathophysiological changes have been described over the years um, and which have kind of stood the test of time, which then ultimately kind of conspire to um, impact 
um, the large vessels, the coronary vessels, and of course, promoting hypercoagulability, increasing the, the, the risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, um, our lab has had a long interest in the heart and, and diabetic um, associated heart failure. And I think it's fair to say that heart failure is um, really increasingly recognized as a diabetic cardiovascular complication. Now, let me show you some data that speaks to this. So this was published by the American Heart Association. This is their, um, their heart and stroke um, update that was published in 2019. And what you're seeing here is um, age-adjusted rates um, for various complications, specifically ischemic heart disease in blue, um, stroke in, in red, heart failure um, in gray, um, in either the general population on the right or the diabetic population on the left. And what you can see over a 20 year period from um, 1995 to 2015 was that there is really a, a steep decline in ischemic heart disease, probably reflecting the um, increased use of statin, um, better um, prevention um, in terms of um, blood pressure treatment, et cetera. You'll notice, however, in the gray bar that heart failure has actually not changed a whole lot over this, over this period of time. Um, the other point I think I want to point out to you is that if you look at the actual rates, you can see that in the general population, the rate of whether it's heart failure or ischemic heart disease is about 11 per um, 10,000, but in the diabetic population, it's about tenfold. So there's a residual um, risk that persists in diabetics, even despite the fact that we have gotten better at treating ischemic heart disease or preventing ischemic heart disease, and, and even in, in the way that we treat um, diabetes. So if you look cross-sectionally at, at the 2015 data point, you, you will see that, in fact, um, at that point in time, um, heart failure was second to ischemic heart disease as a, a cardiovascular complication of diabetes. However, as the, um, um, the, the blue line continues to fall, um, in fact, there is going to be a crossover where heart failure is now going to exceed um, ischemic heart disease as a vascular um, complication of diabetes. Another way to look at this is a really beautiful example from a study performed in Scotland um, in, by the group in Glasgow. And what they did was that they looked at the entire population um, based on um, hospital records and asked the question, what happened to heart failure hospitalization um, over the lifespan and by sex and the presence or absence of diabetes? And what you can see in the blue line is that in fact, heart failure is a disease of aging. And in fact, there's a significant exponential increase in men and women in heart failure hospitalization between ages 60 and 80. However, if you are diabetic, whether you have type one diabetes in green or type two diabetes in red, this shifts the relationship to the left so that this increase in heart failure increase um, occurs probably almost 10 years earlier in individuals with um, diabetes. Here's another example from, of, of, of just the scale of the issue. So this was a study done by um, Justin uh, Mitchell, which a guy at Hopkins, and he just looked at Medicare data and asked, if you're in the hospital with heart failure, what percentage were diabetic? And he says, so you, you'll see in fact that 44% um, of patients who were hospitalized with heart failure had diabetes. And it didn't really matter whether they had heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or heart failure with um, preserved um, ejection fraction. Now, bear in mind that the prevalence of diabetes in the population in the, in the U.S. ranges from 9 to 13 percent. So what this is really telling us is that there's an enrichment of um, diabetes um, within the hospitalized heart failure population. So then it really has, you know, um, strengthened the concept that there's probably a cardiomyopathy of obesity and diabetes. And so the question then, you know, what, what, what is that? <clears throat> and we know there's everybody sort of broadly defined this as intrinsic defects in cardiac muscle as it increases the likelihood that um, cardiac dysfunction will develop in the context of added stressors such as ischemia or cardiac hypertrophy. Here's an example um, from the um, epidemiological study, the ARIC study, that is um, led by Elizabeth Selvin at Hopkins. And um, this has been going on for a, a long time now, but in this particular paper, what she did was she took this population and stratified them by the absence of diabetes, A1C less than 5.7, prediabetes or um, diagnosed diabetes with an A1C greater than 6.5. And then they went back to the freezer and measured um, levels of um, highly sensitive troponin T or did a highly sensitive troponin T assay and used the arbitrary cut point of 40 nanograms per deciliter and asked 
what percentage of patients um, had a level of um, troponin T that was in excess of 40 nanograms per deciliter. So you can see that in the diabetic, in the non-diabetic, so it's 3.7%, which was actually about almost three times higher in the diabetic populations and intermediate in the people with prediabetes. And you can see the, the odds ratio of having an elevation here um, increasing almost threefold in, an, in individuals with diabetes. Moreover, um, when she then looked um, both above the cutoff of 40 nanograms per liter and, with, uh, and beneath the cutoff, this relationship was really true across the entire continuum um, of troponin T levels, again, with lowest levels in individuals without diabetes and then progressively increasing um, in individuals with prediabetes and diabetes. And importantly, this was a very um, strong predictor, both of heart failure and um, all-cause mortality. So what this did really, you know, told us, I think, very, very clearly is that there is a subclinical injury that's taking place um, in, in, in a population setting when one looks at individuals um, with, di with diabetes and no prior history or diagnosis of cardiovascular disease. Now, importantly, heart failure and diabetes share a common metabolic soil, and that, and that common soil is insulin resistance. So as I think everybody um, uh, in, in the audience um, appreciates now is that um, obesity and type 2 diabetes are associated with um, insulin resistance. Um, and at the kind of the cellular level, there are a number of changes that have been well described, including um, ectopic lipid deposition in muscle and liver, um, dysfunction of adipose tissue, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress. Interestingly, if you look at patients with heart failure without diabetes and you measure insulin sensitivity, these individuals are also insulin resistant. And in fact, many of, this, of the tissue level um, changes that are associated with insulin resistance in obesity and type 2 diabetes are also present in individuals um, with heart failure. So if you think about then, if you have metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes and you have heart failure, then there is a coalescence of shared um, underlying pathophysiologic um, changes that potentially can accelerate um, the cardiac pathology. Um, this cartoon um, is sort of summarizing really at a very high level what the broad issues are. So there is um, an abnormal metabolic milieu that um, I'll show you in a subsequent slide um, in, impacts cellular function in the heart that is um, occurring in the context of accelerated vascular disease um, that then um, increases the vulnerability of the heart to fail in the context of diabetes. This cartoon expands on that. And so here is the circulation. There's hyperglycemia, of course, in poorly controlled diabetes. Um, diabetes and insulin resistance are also associated with increased delivery of fatty acids um, to the heart because insulin resistance in, in adipose tissue leads to increased lipolysis. And of course, insulin resistance states are associated with um, a pro-inflammatory state. So beneath the vessel here is the heart. And so what happens in the context of diabetes is that there is substrate overload, which has been termed um, glucotoxicity or, or um, lipotoxicity or glucolipotoxicity, but I like this term carbotoxicity. So basically the heart is being kind of poisoned by um, carbon overload in a way. And um, they, 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 the targets of this um, include the mitochondria, which I spent most of my time um, discussing in this talk, but also there is reprogramming of um, gene expression. Um, and Martin Young, who is speaking later, has done pioneering work um, linking diabetes, insulin, um, metabolites, et cetera, fatty acids to alter transcriptional regulation um, in, in, in the heart. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, all of these changes are really conspiring to um, impair mitochondrial function, alter EC coupling, um, promote fibrosis, and ultimately um, leading to um, myocardial dysfunction. If I zoom in for a second on glucotoxicity, I want to also share a couple of other contexts. Um, um, concept. So glucose is taken up by glucose transporters, um, the, the predominant ones in the heart being glucose 1 and glucose 4. It undergoes glycolysis to generate pyruvate, which then enters the mitochondria to be oxidized. Um, and what occurs when there is increased flux of glucose um, into the heart um, is that there's also increased flux into these, I'm going to call these branch or side pathways of glycolysis, such as the exosamine biosynthetic pathway or the polyol pathway or um, the advanced glycation end product pathway downstream of this rather high 3 phosphate. And so, for example, it's been well described that, um, for example, increased flux through the exosamine biosynthetic pathway can lead to 
um, protein modifications um, called oglucnac modifications, which can alter protein function, including proteins involved in EC coupling, um, proteins involved in the regulation of um, gene expression, and of course, um, proteins involved in mitochondrial metabolism. With regards to lipotoxicity, one of the characteristics of diabetes is that there's increased uptake of fatty acid in the heart. Um, there is um, increased flux into the mitochondria. One of the consequences of this is overproduction of reactive oxygen species, both from mitochondrial sources and extra mitochondrial sources, such as um, NADPH oxidase. In addition to that, the um, lipid overload can lead to the accumulation of um, a variety of um, lipid species. Shown on this cartoon is one example, which is um, ceramide, um, which again, whether through rust mechanisms or independently of that, can ultimately um, lead to um, oxidative-induced protein and DNA damage and um, premature cell death. An important um, functional consequence of um, fatty acid, um, increased fatty acid overload in the heart, which we had demonstrated a number of years ago, is um, rust-induced mitochondrial uncoupling, which actually decreases um, ATP production by mitochondria in the heart and reduces cardiac efficiency. And I'll talk a bit more about that um, in a subsequent slide. So at a very high level then, diabetes alters patterns of myocardial substrate use, leading to increased fatty acid um, utilization and reduced um, glucose oxidation in concert with mitochondrial dysfunction. And multiple mechanisms impair mitochondrial function in diabetic hearts. I mentioned already um, lipotoxicity and glucotoxicity, um, oxidative stress, of course, and also um, insulin resistance um, can also directly um, impair mitochondrial function in the heart um, as well. Now, let me give an example from um, human studies. This study is done by Ethan Anderson. Um, when he was at East Carolina University, I, was, I had the pleasure of actually recruiting Ethan to the University of Iowa, where he's leading a very um, vibrant um, research program. Um, that's, that's, that's very translational. But in this, in this study, what Ethan did was he um, asked the cardiac surgeons at the time of um, coronary artery bypass surgery to give him the left atrial appendage, which they normally would remove and discard when people went on pump. And, and he looked at these um, atrial appendages in both um, non-diabetics who were going for elective coronary artery bypass surgery and diabetics who were going for elective coronary bypass surgery. And observed that, that these um, um, atrial appendages had increased contents of triglyceride and in fact correlated very nicely with glucose control so that as A1C increased, the triglyceride content of these heart samples um, increased. He then permeabilized these um, um, samples and measured oxygen consumption. So we are um, ge measuring general mitochondrial capacity. And you can see here in panel D that in the open circles, in fact, which are the non-diabetics and the, the, the closed circles or the black circles are the diabetics, you can see that oxygen consumption rates were significantly lower in the, um, in the uh, diabetic um, atrial samples relative to the uh, non-diabetic atrial samples. And in fact, there's an inverse relationship between hemoglobin A1C and oxygen consumption. You can see that as glycemic control worsened, um, mitochondrial oxygen consumption um, went down. He then, then, he then measured um, hydrogen peroxide emission as a proxy of measuring um, ROS production um, from um, these mitochondria. And then in contrast, the O2 consumption, what he observed was that hydrogen peroxide emission, these are the black squares the, being diabetic, was significantly increased relative to um, non-diabetics. And this was in panel C and D really are just looking at multiple uh, mitochondrial substrates. You can see that it's really increased um, ROS production um, by these mitochondria. And a consequence of increased ROS production are um, detectable protein modifications that are ROS mediated. So for example, in panel C, he demonstrated that there's increased um, ROS derived adducts. h and &E is hydroxyneninol that was increased in the diabetic samples. And then another one is 3 nitrotyrosine that was also increased in the diabetic samples and that's quantified over here. So this really demonstrated for the first time that there was clear evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction in human heart samples from individuals with diabetes. And this was associated with um, oxidative damage um, of, of, of these um, samples. Now, the other point I want to make is that cardiac mitochondria are uniquely susceptible to dysfunction in the context of diabetes. And I'll show you some animal studies that we performed um, a number of years ago. So this is a, a, a slide from a study by um, Heiko Buger when he was in the, in the lab. Heiko is now a professor at the University of Graz in Austria. 
And we looked at the most model called the Akita mouse. And Akita mice um, have a mutation in the insulin um, gene, which leads to abnormal protein folding. And so they essentially um, have profound beta cell dysfunction at weaning and uh, really a, a type 1 diabetes picture. And so we looked at these animals at about 8 to 10 weeks of age, so fairly young. And, and observed in their in their hearts. You can see, looking on the left, the wild type mitochondria are characterized by nice, um, dense Christi, whereas in the diabetic um, hearts, you can see that the Christi are actually, it's almost like you, you put an air blower in there and kind of blow dried out all the Christi, but essentially you can see that the Christi are much less dense um, and, much, and, 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 and somewhat um, um, re reduced in, in density. In a follow-up study, what Heike then looked at was he said, well, this is true of all mitochondria in the animal. And so we looked at mitochondria from the liver and measured mitochondrial oxygen consumption, as well as ATP synthesis rates, and saw no difference uh, in these young animals. We measured um, oxygen consumption in kidney mitochondria and saw no difference in, in oxygen consumption rates or ATP synthesis. We also did it in brain mitochondria, which I'm not showing. And then, but in the heart samples, we observed that there's a reduction in mitochondrial oxygen consumption rates um, shown here, even maximal um, um, uncoupled respiration rates shown here, as well as a reduction in mitochondrial um, ATP synthesis. We also looked, um, and this is worked by Sihem Budina in a, in a series of studies in um, the OP the OB and DD, DB mice, which are animal models of severe insulin resistance, obesity, and uh, type 2 diabetes on the basis of mutations in either the leptin gene or the leptin receptor. And in this example, I'm just showing you um, um, quantification of um, specific um, subunits of the mitochondrial electron transport chain. What you can see again in these OB animals, there's a significant reduction in, in components of complex one, complex three, and complex five. Um, of, of, of mitochondria. So essentially then what I've told you is that in diabetes, there's increased fat oxidation, increased uptake of, increased delivery of reducing equivalence to a mitochondria which is impaired. And as a consequence of that, that there's overproduction of um, reactive oxygen species. And one of the consequences of this increase in reactive oxygen species is um, mitochondrial uncoupling that leads to increased mitochondrial oxygen consumption. So let me just kind of show you what that means. So this is a mitochondrion um, in the heart. Um, fatty acids are coming in and are being oxidized and the reducing equivalents are driven to the electron transport chain. And um, one of the effects of, um, of or, or the outputs of the electron transport mechanism is the pumping of protons into the um, inter um, membrane space between the outer and inner mitochondrial membrane. This proton um, gradient is then dissipated through ATP synthase, and that drives the synthesis of ATP. Bear in mind that when the protons enter the mitochondrial matrix, they interact with oxygen to, to form water. So when we measure mitochondrial oxygen consumption, we're essentially measuring the flux of protons back into the mitochondrial matrix. However, there are proteins, such as uncoupling proteins and adenine nucleotide transfer cases, which in fact can also lead protons back into the mitochondrial matrix. And when they do that, there is also an in increase in oxygen consumption, but as mitochondria become increasingly uncoupled, auto consumption goes up at the expense of, of ATP synthesis. So you have a scenario where you're consuming more oxygen, but making less ATP. And this is the phenomenon of mitochondrial um, uncoupling, which is a, a true phenomenon in diabetic hearts that contributes to the um, increase in oxygen consumption and a reduction in cardiac efficiency. And so if you think about a heart then as living on more oxygen, um, that as you then begin to constrict, for example, um, blood flow in the context of ischemia, then the threshold at which injury occurs is obviously earlier in the context of a heart that, that's using more oxygen, which is in fact the case um, in, in the uh, diabetic heart. Now, um, let me show you another sort of interesting twist on this whole um, ross mediated um, story uh, in the heart. And this is a concept I want to touch on, which is called mitochondrial dynamics. And I'll, I'll focus on this um, here and also later on, on the talk. And this is a study that was initiated by Heiko and then finished by um, Kensuke Toshishima when he was in the lab. Kensuke is back at the University of Tokyo now. So we looked at an, an animal model um, where we overexpress an enzyme, acyl CoA synthase, um, which essentially um, takes fatty acids and makes fatty acyl CoA. And um, we increased 
the expression of acyl coisynthase one. And um, you can see here in the middle, this is a PET scan of the mouse, and there's increased fatty acid uptake in the hearts of the transgenic animals, about two or three fold. So in the range that one might see in the context of diabetes. And when we did that, we, had, we saw that there's accumulation of, of ceramide and accumulation of um, diacylglycerol. But for the person who stock, the one of the most striking observations was what happened to mitochondrial size. So interestingly, when you're born, you're a mouse at any rate, Mitochondria are small, small in diameter, and then there's a rapid increase in mitochondrial diameter, which occurs um, throughout weaning, which again correlates with an increased mitochondrial oxidative capacity. Interestingly, in these transgenic animals that overexpressed acyl coesynthase, the mitochondria appear to be locked in this small size. Um, this is probably better demonstrated here by this microgram. Um, micrograph. You can see that the transgenic animals have what appear to be tiny fragmented mitochondria relative to the wild type animals, you can see um, what the normal mitochondrial size is. So we thought about this for a while and we said, well, what does this represent? And so we, we began to think about this phenomenon of mitochondrial dynamics. And so as many of you might know that mitochondria undergo these cycles of repeated fusion and fission in all cells, in, in all species. And these are driven by a number of uh, a family of proteins that drive either mitochondrial fission or fusion. So DRP1 is a cytosolic protein that translocates into mitochondria, interacting with Phys1 to drive mitochondrial fission. And OPA1 is an inner mitochondrial membrane protein that drives inner mitochondrial membrane fusion. And MFN1 and MFN2 are outer mitochondrial membrane proteins that drive mitochondrial outer membrane fusion. So one could argue that when you see a pattern like this, um, or the structure, it, perhaps it could represent increased mitochondrial fission or decreased mitochondrial fusion or potentially both. Um, and so um, through a series of, of experiments, we, I think we demonstrated that, but the um, reviewers weren't completely convinced. So what they forced us to do was to actually do um, three-dimensional tomography um, of, of, of these hearts. And I'll just blow this up right here. So on the right, so on the bottom, um, is now the mitochondrial network in the uh, transgenic animals. These are uh, mitochondrial reconstructions in the wild type. And what you can see very clearly is that these lipid overloaded hearts, um, there is really what I'm gonna call a remodeling of the mitochondrial network so that they really look more like noodles or spaghetti. And in fact, are now becoming very tortuous, but narrow and going in and out of the plane. So when you do a 2D section, you see these multiple small structures. And this is in fact what mitochondrial fission looks like um, in the in the adult heart. Now, um, the Ross connection was really kind of nailed by this experiment here. So we generated animals with overexpressed superoxide dismutase tube, which is a Ross scavenger. And you can see if you compare the wild type on the left or the superoxide dismutase tube on the right, you can see that just simply scavenging Ross increases mitochondrial size in the heart. So the mitochondria were significantly larger in the in the sod to transgenic animals. Um, and then, of course, in these ACS animals, which again have increased ROS production, you can see the mitochondria size was smaller. When we crossed the SOD2 mice to the ACS transgenic mice, and we got these compound um, transgenic animals, we normalized mitochondria size, normalized mitochondria number. So what this really tells us then is that there's a dynamic relationship between the redox state of mitochondria and the regulation of our mitochondrial size. And at a mechanistic level, what we observed was altered phosphorylation of DRP1. So let me just make a brief comment about that. So DRP1, as I said before, shuttles between the cytosol and the mitochondria. It has a number of phosphorylation sites, but the one that we focused on was serine 637. It's a protein kinase A or PKA dependent phosphorylation event, such that um, when it's phosphorylated on the site, it is cytosolic and inactive. When it's dephosphorylated, it is on the mitochondria and drives mitochondrial fission. And um, the proximity of DRP1 to PKA is mediated by an anchoring protein called ACAP121. And so what we observed was that there was, um, in the presence of lipid overload and in a ROS-dependent manner, there was um, proteosomal degradation of ACAP121, which actually reduced PKA-dependent phosphorylation of DRP1. Um, in addition to that, there was altered proteolytic cleavage of OPA1 that then drove this um, morphological change in the, in, in the heart. So to summarize then this part that there are multiple mechanisms that um, lead to uh, mitochondrial dysfunction in diabetes. I, I mentioned impaired oxfast, 
um, on copying of mitochondria over production of ROS. Um, and then I showed an example of altered mitochondrial dynamics. What I didn't show you are examples of altered oglutinib modifications of proteins, um, altered autophagy, and impacts of altered insulin signaling. But the message I want to you to kind of walk away with here is that the mitochondria are impaired via multiple mechanisms um, in the context of um, diabetes, obesity, and insulin resistance. I want to step back a little bit and talk about heart failure in general and talk about heart metabolism. This is a cartoon um, um, courtesy of um, Gary Lokusha, um, published in Circulation Research recently. And um, you can see that the heart is really an omnivore. It really has to oxidize multiple substrates to generate ATP to maintain um, cardiac contractile function. But the predominant substrate is um, fatty acids, followed by lactate and glucose, and then with smaller contributions in healthy hearts from um, ketones. However, um, in heart failure, and Gary will go into this in a lot more detail, is that there is a shift in, um, in, in metabolism such that the, um, is, the contribution of glucose oxidation goes down, the contribution of fatty acid oxidation to TCA flux um, goes down. There's um, a relative preservation of glycolysis that, that leads to a mismatch between glycolysis um, and glucose oxidation. And then there's also an increase in ketone utilization in the failing heart. We have had an interest recently in, in, in the consequences of this, mis of this mismatch between glycolysis and glucose oxidation. So the concept again here is that glucose carbons enter, um, they undergo glycolysis. However, because of mitochondrial impairment in the failing heart, there is um, in, in a, a reduction in oxidation of this glucose and accumulation of glycolytic intermediates that then increase flux into, into these um, pathways for example, the hexosamine biosensitive pathway, the pentose phosphate pathway, manose pathways, and one carbon metabolic pathways. So to put it kind of at a high level then, that in the failing heart, there is impaired mitochondrial um, oxidative capacity, decreased ATP synthesis, but the carbons are still coming in. And so the carbons then get diverted into other pathways, such as the hexosamine biosynthetic pathway or pathways that promote um, rust production, which, um, then can, in a number of ways, um, lead to um, myocardial contractile dysfunction. Let me give you an example from some recent unpublished work from a lab looking at human heart failure samples. So these are patients um, with end-stage heart failure. So these are samples of, these are explanted hearts at the time of heart transplantation, um, and then um, donor hearts that were not used. So you can again see that, you see that the, the patients were um, sort of middle-aged, um, and there's a significant reduction in, in ejection fraction and significant um, increase in cardiac mass in the failing hearts. So we submitted these hearts to uh, metabolomics analysis. And when you do that, you get this thing here called a volcano plot, where you can plot those metabolites, which are um, increased on the right or decreased on the left. Um, in, 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 importantly for this stock, the most highly um, induced or increased metabolites were glucose metabolites, sorbitol, mannose, galactose, galactosamine. And I'll show that in the next slide um, as a bar plot. So we saw an increase in free glucose. Um, we saw an increase in mannose. And mannose, of course, can increase N-link glycation, which can increase extracellular remodeling and promote inflammatory signaling. There's increasing sorbitol in these hearts, and sorbitol, um, can lead to depletion of NADPH and glutathione that can promote oxidative stress. There's an increase in galactose, galactonic acid, and galactosamine. Um, and galactosamine is a very potent activator of ROS age um, rage signaling pathways that is, in fact, very um, pro inflammatory. So, this pattern of abnormal metabolism really makes the case that there are pathways that potentially are being activated in the failing heart that can contribute to an acceleration of um, um, ventricular remodeling. And these are all pathways derived from um, incomplete um, glucose oxidation. So we wanted to, to model this in a mouse model. And the, the way that we chose to do this was we um, focused on the pyruvate carrier. So pyruvate has to go through the pyruvate carrier to enter mitochondria. Um, and to then complete the TCA cycle. So the hypothesis was that if we impaired pyruvate transport in the mitochondria, we get accumulation of glycolytic intermediates. And so um, we made animals where we knocked out um, the uh, mitochondrial pyruvate carrier one, because MPC1 um, lives in a complex with MPC2, that MPC2 also gets degraded. 
When we measured mitochondrial pyruvate uptake, we saw that there's a significant reduction in mitochondrial pyruvate uptake, as well as a reduction in um, pyruvate supportive mitochondrial respirations, as shown here. Importantly, for the whole concept of where do, they, where do these excess glucose carbons go, um, in this panel, we've we blotted for um, oglucanat modified protein, and you can see very clearly that there's an increased accumulation of oglucanat modified proteins in these mutant um, hearts, and also there's increased glycogen accumulation um, as well. Interestingly, um, these hearts spontaneously develop an age-dependent heart failure. So the hearts are perfectly normal at birth. By eight weeks, they have um, um, uh, compensated um, but pathologic cardiac hypertrophy. By 12 weeks, they're beginning to dilate, and you can see by 34 weeks, they have a dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, EF falls off dramatically, and of course, there's increased um, mortality as well. So we asked the question then, um, was this really just because these hearts were just either starved of, of glucose, or could it be something else? And so to address that, um, um, we put these animals on a ketogenic diet, um, and also a, a non-ketogenic high-fat diet, which had a similar result. So if you take the knockout animals when their hearts are failing, and we put them on a ketogenic diet, you can see we actually reverse remodeled the heart and restored um, ventricular function in these animals. And again, you can see that they, there was a regression of cardiac hypertrophy and restoration of ejection fraction um, as shown here. Now, importantly, when we actually looked at glucose use in these hearts, by, by substituting ketones or fat in these animals, we completely shut off glucose use in these hearts. And so these hearts were actually not using glucose. Um, and so it was not there, you needed glucose to be oxidized. But more importantly, what we observed was that the spillover of the glucose carbons into these pathways, shown here, for example, the oglucanac pathway or glycogen, with this second bar being the animals on normal chow, and the, this bar on the far right being the mutant animals on the keto diet was that we were now pre preventing the diversion of these um, glucose carbons into these injurious pathways. So what I hope to have kind of conveyed from this part of the talk is that in fact, um, accumulation of glucose metabolites in the heart, um, we believe these data would, would argue could in fact exacerbate um, heart failure. So um, as you all know for the clinicians in the, in the audience that, you know, when we know, you know, start people on, um, glucose lowering therapy, we now must um, consider the presence or the risk for cardiovascular disease. And so um, the current guidelines really now argue that if um, atherosclerotic vascular disease predominates, then um, GFP1 receptor agonists are probably um, indicated earlier on in the treatment paradigm or SHT inhibitors. For sure, if heart failure is predominant or there's a risk of heart failure or there's chronic kidney disease, SJT2 inhibitors are the preferred agents um, with or without a backward of metformin. And then insulin is required. And of course, DPP4 inhibitors and other agents are less, less likely to be recommended now um, as, um, as, as therapeutics. Importantly, with regards to heart failure, I think we, we all know that SJT2 inhibitors um, really are the, the only class at the present time that has had a consistent effect on reducing heart failure hospitalizations in multiple clinical trials. And even though we have met multiple other agents that can um, lower blood glucose via a number of different mechanisms, um, with the exception of SJT2 inhibition, the effects on heart failure are variable. And even with SJT2 inhibition, the heart does not completely revert to a non-diabetic risk state. And the reason for that is because there are multiple patho physiologic changes occurring in the heart in the context of diabetes, um, which I think still represent um, viable um, therapeutic targets. You can't read this slide, and it was my intent, but this is a review article that um, Heiko um, wrote recently, looking, for example, at um, experimental evidence, looking at targeting oxidative stress, for example, in preclinical models of um, diabetes, showing that there is evidence um, with a number of um, strategies um, at targeting oxidative stress that may in fact um, um, have a potential beneficial effect in um, um, reducing the risk of heart failure in the context of um, diabetes. So I'm gonna end the talk with um, some unpublished work, again, just on, in, in linking mitochondrial dynamics and another aspect of cardiometabolic disease, which is um, thrombosis. And just to remind you again, that um, 
There are a number of proteins involved in mitochondrial dynamics, OPA1, again, an inner mitochondrial membrane protein that um, drives inner mitochondrial membrane fusion. But also importantly, OPA1 is important in maintaining um, the, the, the Christi integrity because it's, imagine it's like a, like a, a part of a complex of proteins that sits at the base of the Christi and is required for you know, maintaining the Christi in, in, in this folded um, fashion. So we got intrigued by an observation that was made by Jane Friedman. So Jane studies, um, is a vascular biologist and she's a, a population a molecular epidemiologist. And so she looked in the, um, in the Framingham cohort and isolated platelets from um, um, cohort eight in the Framingham study that many of you are familiar with and um, looked at um, by, Q, by quantitative PCR, the level of transcripts of a number of um, genes and platelets. And this is the data from OPA1. Um, and the CT value for those of you who do um, quantitative PCR is that the higher the CT value, then um, the lower the expression, the lower the CT value, the higher the expression. You can see that there was um, a statistically reduced CT value in females, meaning that OPA1 levels were in fact higher in female platelets. And in fact, when she looked at a number of genes that um, were, were, were measured, very interestingly, um, OPA1 levels in platelets um, predicted female sex um, with a p-value of like 10 to the minus 15. So the question then is, what does this have to do with anything? And so um, we got um, funded um, to do a study looking at the relationship um, between OPA1 levels in platelets and thrombosis and sex. And so in a cohort of um, pregnancy, um, we looked at um, estrogen levels before pregnancy in the third trimester. And you can see pregnancy is a state where there's a dramatic increase in estrogen levels, as you can see here, the kind of estradiol levels or estriol levels between pre-pregnancy and the, and the third um, trimester. And then when we looked at OPA1 expression, we saw that there is an increase in OPA1 expression in the third trimester of pregnancy relative to pre-pregnancy samples. And these these are longitudinal studies. So these are studies done in the same patients. And then in the postpartum period, um, these levels fall. Um, YME1L1, which is a protease that regulates OPA1, is also regulated in this way um, between um, pre-pregnancy, third trimester, and, 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 and postpartum. Again, suggesting that there's potentially hormonal regulation um, of OPA1 in the context of pregnancy. What I didn't show you is that we also see an increase in platelet activation um, at, um, in, in the third trimester of pregnancy as well. So Rhonda Souvenir, who is a colleague um, um, in the lab and, and uh, an assistant professor now at UCLA, um, we, we asked the question, in an animal model, what could we learn about the relationship between platelet levels of OPA1 and, um, and thrombosis? So we generated um, mice with platelet-specific knockouts of OPA1 using the PF4-driven um, Cree promoter um, to drive, um, to recombine the OPA1 allele that was um, flanked by um, LOXP sites. So if one looks at mitochondria and platelets, and platelets are these small um, acellular fragments, so they don't have a lot of mitochondria. So you can see here like three mitochondria in wild type platelets. And if you look very closely, you can see that they have nice Christi, right? Whereas in these male animals, when we knock out OPA1 from the platelets, you can see the, the, the Christi pattern is what, what I call um, tubular Christi, which is what you see when you lose OPA1. So the normal pattern is these lamellar Christi. Here you're seeing these tubular Christi in these male OPA1 deficient animals. Remarkably, in the female animals that were lacking OPA1, they might, the, the Christi morphology was completely normal. That was a surprise to us, um, suggesting that there is a sex dependent um, relationship between OPA1 and the effect on mitochondrial morphology. We then, um, being good endocrinologists, um, took out the gonads. So on the top are males and the bottom are females. And um, on the left are controls and the right are knockouts. And um, they were either subjected to sham surgery or had their gonads removed. And so again, hope you can see if you look very closely here that um, in the um, male animals that were knocked, and I showed this before, there is this altered Christe morphology in these platelets. But when we um, remove their gonads, you can see that the Christe morphology is normalizing in these platelets. The females, the knuckles I showed you before, have normal Christe morphology. But when we remove their ovaries, 
we now see um, abnormal Christi morphology um, in their in their pit and mitochondria. Again, suggesting that there's a relationship between OPA1 and, and estrogen. If we then looks at um, in vitro measures of platelet activation, this is in males on the top in blue. That again, um, you can see in vitro there is increased platelet ac activation in the males. Um, that's the that's the open bars with the blue squares relative to the closed bars, which are the controls. Whereas in the females shown here in um, red or pink, that in fact there was no evidence of increased platelet activation in the knockout platelets relative to the control platelets. We can also give animal DVTs by ligating the um, inferior vena cava. And you can see that the male knockout animals had increased thrombus, but the female animals did not. And then we can also look at um, arterial occlusion as a way of measuring platelet activation, where you essentially paint something called rose bengal on the artery and then shine a laser on the artery and measure the time to stable occlusion. And what you can see here is that in the male OPA1 deficient animals, the time to occlusion was decreased. In other words, the arteries clot quicker, whereas in the females, the time to occlusion was increased. So the same gene is deleted in males and females, but the effect um, on the uh, on, on thrombotic risk is completely opposite. So we wanted to further explore whether this was due to the hormonal milieu. So um, we did a very interesting experiment where we took male donor platelets and then put them into uh, either a, a male host or a female host that was repeated to reconstitute and then repeated the experiment. So when we went from male donors to a male host, you can see again, the time to stable occlusion is reduced. But when we went from male OPA1 deficient donors to a, a female wild type host, um, the time to occlusion was increased. Um, similarly, if we went from a female donor to a female host, we saw the increased time to occlusion but a female donor platelets into a male host, in fact, that increased time to occlusion was um, um, abolished. This is also showing um, um, the effect of castration in males or, or, or um, oophorectomy in females. Again, looking at in vitro activation of, of platelets. Just focus here, perhaps just on, 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 on this those point here, that you can see that in the um, intact animals, if you're a male, you have increased activation of platelets, take out the testes, this goes away. Whereas in the females, um, in the intact females, um, there is no increase in activation. Take the ovaries out and the knockout females and now have hyperactive um, platelets. And then similarly, when we looked at um, time to occlusion in males with and without testes, again, you can see in the intact males, a decrease in time to occlusion. In the conductomized males, a decrease in the time to occlusion. And in the females, the opposite was seen that um, intact females increased time to stable occlusion, whereas the conductomized females, um, this, is, this, this in fact is removed. And finally, if we gave the male animals a, an estrogen pellet and made them hyperestrogenic, again, you can see that the placebo treated animals had a reduction in the time to stable occlusion, whereas the um, animals with estradiol had an increase in the time to occlusion. So, mechanistically, then, you know, what is going on? So, kind of cut to the chase. We asked the question, could estrogens be directly um, impacting mitochondrial Christi and, and the risk of thrombosis? And so in this experiment, what we did was we isolated mitochondria, this time from um, OPA1 deficient brown fat, because we had to get enough mitochondria to do the experiment. So again, you can see here that, uh, and then we incubated these mitochondria in vitro with either cholesterol, tamoxifen, or various concentrations of estradiol. So you can see, if you compare the controls to the knockouts, you can see the, the, the beautiful Christi in the controlled mitochondria, the abnormal Christi in the knockout mitochondria. But if we expose them in vitro to tamoxifen or estradiol, we can in fact refold the, the, the Christi as it were, or restore um, the mitochondrial um, Christi um, morphology. And this is quantified down here, looking at the ratio of tubular to lamellar Christi. So in the knockouts, they are more tubular Christi, and then in the estrogen treated animals, um, we restore the ratio of lamellar to tubular Christi. And it turns out that estrogen is taken up by mitochondria. We measured this by mass spec. You can see we had um, significant uptake of estrogen um, in mitochondria. Importantly, the male mitochondria take up a lot more estrogen than the um, female mitochondria um, do. So what we learned then from this study was that in fact, if you um, alter the expression of OPA1, um, in platelets, in the males, you have decreased mitochondrial respiration, increased activation of platelets, increased venous thrombosis, increased arterial thrombosis, um, and that this 
this was reversed when you transferred these platelets into a female host or reversed with removing the testes. Whereas in the females, in fact, they were pretty resistant in terms of the negative consequence of OP1 deficiency in their platelets. And in fact, um, if anything, um, had were protected um, from arterial um, thrombosis. So is this true in people? Um, and so because the reviewers were not happy with us doing this in vitro experiment using um, uh, mitochondria from another tissue, not that one, not platelet. So um, we were able to generate um, human megakaryocytes derived from um, cord um, blood um, um, stem cells. And then we're able to use CRISPR to reduce OPA1 expression in these cells. And so you can see a nice knockdown of OPA1 by CRISPR here. And you can see evidence of um, altered reduced mitochondrial membrane potential in these um, CRISPR deleted cells consistent with um, impaired mitochondrial function. So we then took these human megakaryocytes with and without OPA1 deletion and incubated them in estradiol um, in vitro. So um, on the left is a wild type. Um, megakaryocyte. On the right is an OPA1 deficient megakaryocyte. And so, for example, if you just look where my cursor is at those two mitochondria there, you see that the Christi look like tubes. So these are tubular Christi um, shown here. But after incubating um, these, and, and multiple mitochondria have this tubular Christi morphology. Whereas if you look down here at the uh, megakaryocytes that are estrogen exposed, then you can actually see that the Christi are now refolded um, when we expose them to um, estradiol. So what, they want to, what we think is happening is that the estrogen is, is, is affecting the fluidity of the inner mitochondrial um, membrane so that even in the absence of OPA1, other proteins are able to um, restore the um, morphology of, of the Christine. So the last thing before I end that is, so what, right? I mean, is this have anything to do with thrombosis in humans? So um, Jennifer Streeter, who's a, a cardiology fellow and now a junior faculty at the University of, of Iowa, introduced us to this database. So for all of the physicians in the room, you all have the EMR, you all have EPIC, and you're constantly putting data of, of your patients into, into EPIC. So, so like, guess what happens to all this data? It actually can be aggregated um, and, you know, kind of given access by third parties. So one of these third parties is called Trinetics. And basically, they have taken EMR, um, anonymized EMR data from over 250 million patients across the world. And now you have a searchable database where you can actually pull things out. So what we did was we said, okay, let us query this database for adult patients who have a clinical syndrome associated with OPA1 mutations called autosomal dominant optic atrophy. And we wanted to find people who were had their that diagnosis confirmed either genetically or by um, sequencing. And then we, we asked the question, in these patients, was there any difference in multiple measures of arterial or venous um, thrombosis? I'm gonna show you all this. I'm just gonna show you one table that I think um, encap encapsulates the main findings. So we, um, you'll see that one of the beauties of this is that you can essentially when you find all your patients with an OPA1 mutation, you can then in, a, in the database essentially completely match them with um, non-affected patients who are demographically otherwise identical in terms of age, um, sex, drug use, et cetera. And then we ask the question, if you compared patients with an OPA1 mutation or patients without an OPA1 mutation, what was the difference in risk in um, being a stronger embolism. So that, so that, that, that is the question that, that we that we are um, asking. We also divided the population into two groups because it turns out that if you have an OPA1 mutation, as you age, you either get musculoskeletal or um, nervous system disorders as coded um, in this database. And we wanted to look at people with um, without nervous system disease or people with nervous system disease. And we get the same results when you look at people with or without um, neuromuscular or, or, or musculoskeletal disease. So what you can see here is that patients with OPA1 mutations, relative to controlled patients, have a 2.45 increase risk ratio of thrombosis in the absence of, um, of, of um, neurologic um, the, disorders. If you take males and you come with OPA1 mutation and compare them to, to males without OPA1 mutations, again, there's an increased risk in thrombosis. If you take females, there's also an increased risk in thrombosis. If you compare males and females with OPA1 mutations, 
in the absence of um, nervous system disorders, the p-value weakens. However, in patients with um, nervous system disorders, again, um, all patients, they have more thrombosis. Um, males have more thrombosis than wild-type uh, males. OPA1 females have more thrombosis than OPA1 um, than, than, than controlled females. But it, importantly, that if you, are, if you have um, um, nervous system or musculoskeletal um, disorders, if you have an OPA1 mutation, you're a male relative to a female with an OPA1 mutation, in fact, you have, a, you have an increased risk of thrombosis. So we think that this phenomenon is really holding true um, in, in large human cohorts. So what does this mean? So in conclusion then, you know, we, we, we show that males or females with OPA1 mutations have increased venous thromboembolism relative to subjects without OPA1 mutations, and males with OPA1 mutations have increased venous thromboembolism relative to females with OPA1 mutations, which is exacerbated when there's um, central nervous system or neurological um, disorders. So, so to end then, I hope you'll give me a story that um, there's this interaction um, between OPA1 expression and um, estrogen. I think from an evolutionary standpoint, um, if you think about pregnancy as, as, as a state that when the placenta separates, um, you need to have thrombosis, you need to have hemostasis, that in fact, um, this really is, is a critical mechanism to drive that. And perhaps this might also enable us to identify individuals who may be at increased risk of thrombosis um, when they're exposed to estrogen, depending on um, the intrinsic differences um, in, in OPA1 um, expression levels. So um, I hope I've managed to kind of convince you that mitochondria are important and that mitochondria have a number of ways that they interact with um, cardiometabolic disease, both in terms of heart failure and in terms of um, thrombosis. And, and, and just to end, you know, let me just acknowledge um, my lab members. This is our COVID picture taken before the move. This is a lab now moved to California before people moved over. This is my mom. She came and helped us unpack some boxes. This is my son and daughter and son-in-law. And I want to also um, acknowledge um, a number of collaborators who contributed to the work um, which I described today. So thank you very much um, for this opportunity to share this with you this morning. Dale, thank you so much for an outstanding presentation. And um, we've learned a lot. I want to, we have several questions uh, from the audience. Um, and I want to just remind uh, the attendees that they can ask questions by using the Q&A prompt. Um, and although I think we may not get time to ask many of them at this point, um, I hope, Dale, you'll be able to respond to them uh, later, um, sure. you know, directly online. Uh, I just want to make, um, you know, a couple comments. And uh, one, um, you know, one of the things that's striking is how many things can go wrong when you disrupt fuel metabolism. But it's also striking how many things work well in health, in normal physiology, and how what a delicate balance, you know, we maintain, you know, through our lifespans and in our health. Uh, which is really something I think your talk helped me appreciate. Uh, one of the things that was also striking um, and will become a theme in the next session is the importance of fuel selection and the role of glucose and carbohydrate metabolism. Um, so I want to encourage people to stick around for that. Uh, Gary Lopeshek and Martin Young will be discussing that. And uh, Carlos Santos Gallegos uh, will be talking about how important that is in mediating effects of a, the SGLT2 inhibitors in uh, clinical settings and treating heart failure. Um, and then finally, I wanted to ask you, Gail, uh, Dale, um, you know, it's really interesting how providing ketones improve the uh, balance of glycolytic metabolites. And do you have any thoughts about how that happens? Yes, if I understand your 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 question, um, Terry. So, with regards to the 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 the, the ketone experiments, are you asking why the hearts improved? Or are you asking why there was this reduction in 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 the in the glucose carbon um, spillover? Yeah, in the glucose carbon spillover. Yeah, yeah. So, so essentially, what I think we did in these experiments was we basically just forced the heart to oxidize a lot of another substrate that we're giving to it. So it didn't need the glucose anymore. So when I actually looked at, you know, the, the glucose flux pathways, um, either on the high fat diet or on the, um, the ketogenic diet, essentially those hearts were not using any glucose whatsoever. 
right? And 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 so they're just living on fat or living on ketones. Yeah. And this was important for us in this experiment because we weren't sure a priori whether the phenotype that we're seeing was because of glucose deprivation or something else. And so by doing this experiment, we essentially had a heart that was we knew was not using glucose, at least at the level of oxidation. But what we were also doing, we essentially were siphoning off all of these other glucose, into these other records, intermediates, which we argue were actually drivers of some of this um, ventricular remodeling. So it's kind of like the Randall effect, you know, uh, where uh, ketone metabolism inhibits glycolytic flux and maybe therefore the accumulation of glycolytic intermediates and backup of all of these metabolites. So one possibility. So I do want to. Uh, take one question uh, from the audience, which um, w is gone. Okay. No, I, I, I was answering some online, but if, okay. I'm going to open the tab here. So, and so Raghu Murmura asked about, which I think is a really good question. So, he asked about, um, you know, many of the factors which I described, um, yes. the Google lip lipotoxicity, and hi, Raghu, good to kind of see you online, sort of. I know you're in the webinar somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that you know they can also lead to beta cell defects, right? And so you know his question was, is there you know based is about the endocrine function of the heart, like ANP release, is there any impact of these abnormal um, metabolic states on that? So it turns out, which is interesting, I think for the cardiologists in the audience, you know that you know um, neprilysin, which has ANP or BNP in it, is used to treat heart failure, right? And so in one sense there's probably a state of relative ANP resistance in heart failure. Um, and there is evidence that if you look at people with obesity or the metabolic syndrome, the induction of ANP in the failing heart is actually even less than in non-diabetics, right? So, so in one sense, if we think of the increase in ANP as an, as an attempt to, or in ANP and BNP as an attempt to adapt um, in the failing heart, that even that adaptation is somehow being stymied in the context of um, obesity and the and the metabolic syndrome, so it's, so I think there are going to be papers coming out really looking at this whole notion of you know either NP resistance or relative NP deficiency, and in fact this is exacerbated in the context of the uh, metabolic syndrome. So um, that was from Raju Miramura, uh, who's the head of endo uh, endocrine um, in the over at U of C. Um, so. Um, one last question, um, the effect of estrogens on mitochondria. Yeah. It seems very important and maybe important because energy metabolism is so sexually dimorphic in many ways. And I wonder whether this is going to be important, you know, in helping to understand that. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, we are very excited by these results because I think, you know, when one thinks of estrogen, you know, estrogen is classically thought to work by banning estrogen receptors in the nucleus, right? Platelets are in nuclear, and the effects I showed you were occurring pretty quickly within 30 minutes of like, you know, transfusion experiments, et cetera. And so, you know, we think that this is going to define yet another estrogen action, which is estrogen directly on the mitochondria, um, altering um, membrane dynamics in a way that um, then relates to other proteins like OPA1, for example, which, you know, are important in Christic integrity and then the subsequent bioenergetics that drives um, platelet activation. So, so, so we think this is kind of interesting and may in fact help to explain kind of what happens in pregnancy and may also help to explain some of the sex differences um, in risk of thrombosis, for example. A lot of the um, 